Hey, welcome everybody to uh, the 39th uh, Annual District Conference of the Wesleyan Methodist Church, South Queensland District. Um, it extends from Bundaberg down to the border, out west, and all of Northern Territory as well, because we just like to extend our borders. Um, we actually have a bumper attendance here today. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thanks for registering. I don't know quite if it's a world record um, <laughs> for our conference, but uh, lovely to be uh, gathering together here as the people of God who make up um, uh, the pastors and leaders and delegates of our conference. We entitled this conference, uh, the theme being um, Gospel and Gospel Powered Holiness. Gospel Powered Holiness. And uh, I'm trusting God that that theme is woven through all the things that are uh, spoken about and said and shared um, over the course of this gathering. Um, and, and so to kind of, uh, I don't know if I'm putting a bow on it or if I'm just building a foundation for it, one or the other, um, to give you my definition, at least my working definition of what we're talking about when we talk about gospel-powered holiness, it is about the work of God in our lives, advancing, not through our own effort, but through our surrender. You see, because in the gospel, in the gospels, uh, the gospel, it, it, it turns conventional wisdom on its head, right? You know, Jesus says the first will be last. No, that's not how it works on this world. Well, actually, according to the kingdom, it does. And, and uh, you know, the... Uh, those who are humble will be lifted up. And um, you know, there's a whole heap of those kind of ideas. Give and it'll be given to, uh, unto you. Uh, where the gospel is turned on its head. And we think, conventional wisdom says, holiness is putting more effort into becoming like Jesus. And I want to tell you today, that is not correct. Now, God is not against effort. He's against earning. But he's not against effort. But... What happens in our lives that is of eternal value happens when we surrender and allow his work to take place in our lives. I'm aware that we've all come from different weeks, months, years, um, and some of us come with celebration, some of us come with grief, some of us come with pain, some of us come in trepidation. And can I get a little bit less of me so I can speak louder? <laughs> More of Jesus and less of me. Um, all of Jesus and none of the world. Um, and so this morning's devotion, I, I bring as a ministry to you. I hope that this will minister to your hearts, minister to your souls, that uh, wherever you come from, whatever uh, you're experiencing now, be it an embarrassing phone call, <laughs> um, no, Maybe a good, thank you for t reminding us all that we should t turn our phones onto silent right now. Um, uh, I planned that. Thank you, Peter, for helping me out. Um, so, <laughs> whatever we've come with, whatever we, we've come to, let's let God's word speak to us and minister to us today. Let me start with this question. Who here remembers, and you're probably older than me if you're going to put your hand up, who here remembers where you were what you were doing on the 20th of July, 1969. <laughs> Let me phrase it this way. Do you remember what TV you were watching and where you were when the first man walked on the moon? At school. I was still inside my mummy's tummy. <laughs> what about, for those of you not quite so old, September 11, 2001, you remember waking up that morning where you were? What about that Friday morning just a few weeks ago when we woke up to discover that we now have a king? These are some memories that live with us. In fact, the most recent one uh, will live with us for uh, the rest of our lives as well. We, we, none of us in the British Empire, let me put it that way, know what it's like to have a king before today. None of us are that old. 
Well, actually, some of us might. <laughs> some of us might be. But... I mention this because there was a young king in the Old Testament named Hezekiah who would have lifelong vivid memories of exactly where he was and who he was with and what he was doing the day he received a letter from a neighbouring king, a king of a neighbouring nation that was a large nation, telling them, telling him that unless he was to surrender, this neighbouring king's army of 185,000 soldiers were going to invade Jerusalem and kill every man, woman and child. You would think that he would remember when that letter came, what he was doing, perhaps even what he was wearing. Hezekiah was only 39 years old and he knew that this maniac neighbouring king had the power to do what he had threatened. And so I imagine Hezekiah picking up this handwritten letter and, and scanning through it, probably just to get the gist of it, and then realising the weight of what he's reading and taking his time to soak in all of the details of what has been communicated. Perhaps as he's reading it, his hands start getting more and more shaky as he's getting hold of the, the gravity of the situation. He starts to feel sick in his stomach. Just before he falls in a heap, he realises one thing. He realises that his only hope, his only hope is God. That is his only hope. It's God or massacre. It's God or total destruction. There is no other human possibility. Either God steps in or everyone I know, it's over. I wonder if some of you here today, this has been a recent or maybe even current situation for you. You've been confronted with something humanly impossible. You've received terrible news. Maybe for others here, it's not so recent, but you remember a time when you received news like that, news so terrible that you can remember right where you were when you received it. News of a group of people leaving your church. A church split is about to take place. An unfair accusation has come against you as the pastor of the church. A friend, board member, ally turned against you. Or maybe something more personal. Maybe it's an unexpected medical diagnosis. A rebelling child. A blow that has come to your marriage. News so terrible that you will never forget where you were that morning, that evening, when you read that email or received that message. For some of you, the news has been a growing reality. Things are getting bad. For others, that news hit you like a sledgehammer. So much so that in that moment you, you knew, you just knew that all was lost except for your hope in Jesus Christ. That the only hope was God. No other human possibility, no other human reality, no human plan was going to get you out of this mess. Either God is going to step in or it's over. Well, let's read what Hezekiah does. Just turn in your Bibles with me to Hezekiah chapter 2. Can you find it, Joel? <laughs> Let's try 2 Kings chapter 19. For those who are madly looking for the book of Hezekiah, <laughs> you should sign up and do uh, Gordon's course in, course in the Old Testament. Because <laughs> there is no book of Hezekiah. Hezekiah's uh, story is recorded in Kings chapter 19, uh, 2 Kings, and we're in 19, verses 14 and 15. It says, when Hezekiah read the letter, he went straight to the, the temple of the Lord and he spread the letter out before God. And verse 15 says, and prayed. And, and I love this imagery. I, I love the picture uh, of what takes place here, that he, he takes this threatening, handwritten letter from this neighbouring king and he, he lays it out before God in the temple. He just lays it out there before God. And says, God, this problem is too big for me to handle. This problem is too big for me. I'm handing it over to you. I, I love this picture of handing it over, laying it out before God. Like, like an offering, like a sacrifice, releasing it. 
this threatening handwritten letter from the king. He runs to the temple. He hands it over. He says, I can't do this. And in total desperation and total surrender, he hands this over to his God. Scripture says that after he spreads this letter out, he begins to pray. Here's how he begins to pray. Verse 15, he says, Lord, God of Israel, and throned between the cherubim. Now that is a statement about, this is a theological statement about the imminence of God. He's speaking, he's describing how close God is. He's here in the temple, dwelling between the angels of the cherubim on, on the Ark of the Covenant. That's what he's referring to. Lord God of Israel, enthroned here amongst us between the cherubim. And then he goes on to describe the transcendence of God. You alone, God, are over all of the earthly kingdoms. You have made heaven and earth. And I don't know if you notice what he's doing here in this prayer. But he's filling his faith tank as he prays. He's reminding himself of the one who he's praying to. He's reminding himself of who his God is. How close and personal dwelling there in the temple between the, the wings of the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. Close and personal. Knowing my problems. Knowing my situations. This is going to affect the temple too. This is going to affect the Ark of the Covenant too. Uh, God is here but also he's overall. He, he's not in the midst of this problem. He sees this from above. He's powerful. And so he starts saying, Lord God, I'm thrown on high. You are the creator, the God of the universe. You're, you're the one who controls everything. Every king, every kingdom, every power is under your oversight, under your control. You're the one with unlimited power. But you're also close. And you see my need and you know my heart. He does this because there's a huge difference between wishing some God would do something and believing your own God has sufficient power to do anything that he chooses to do. There's a big difference. Hezekiah reminds himself, he's filling his own faith tank. He says, God, the God who spoke the world into being, who flung the stars into space, surely he has the power to handle this, this situation, to deal with this murderous, sword-waving, lunatic king. Surely he cares enough about me to do it. Hezekiah understands that faith is really critical to our prayers. And so he begins his prayer by filling his own faith tank, reminding himself of who this God is, the imminence and the transcendence of God. I find myself having to do this when I, when I pray, when I am in a desperate need. If I, if I don't start by reminding myself who it is that I'm praying to, my prayers can descend, and you might be able to relate to this, descend into half-hearted wishes. If I don't take the time to remind myself who it is, the power, the majesty, the holiness of the one I'm praying to, I'm just throwing words into the universe, not expecting in my heart that God's really going to do much about it. But when I'm desperate... When I'm desperate to see God do something in my life, in my family, in a difficult situation, in the church, in the district, in some of your lives, my I have. I need to be reminded that God is the creator, the sustainer of the universe, all-powerful, all-knowing, and also here with me. And when I do that, then I have the power, I have the faith, sorry, to say, God, you have the power to handle this problem, and so I ask, will you please handle it? I have the power to both, sorry, the faith to both ask God to handle it, but then also the discipline to not try to fix it myself. Hezekiah, after he's done uh, praying that introduction to the prayer, where he fills his faith tank, reminds himself of, of the bigness of, and the closeness of God all in one. He says, now, Lord. Now, Lord. And it's just a simple request. Now, Lord, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms on this earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. He's in the temple. He's got this letter laid out before God. He's, the enemy uh, king is going to attack and kill his a whole city. And Hezekiah prays simply and sincerely, God, will you deliver us from this king? Will you deliver me from this 
enemy. Hezekiah does something in the 6th century BC that the Apostle Paul in the 1st century AD instructs us all to do, which is in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it simply says, present your requests to God. Simply present your requests to God. No flowery language needed, no groveling necessary. You have been invited by the God of the universe to simply and sincerely present your requests to him. Hezekiah simply prayed, please, Lord, deliver us from the evil king's hand. That's all he asks, deliver us. Then he says something that is so powerful and so profound that honestly we read this and we miss it. He says, so that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you alone are God. There's two key words in that in that part of the prayer, pivotal words, words that make a huge difference in that prayer, the words are so that. You see, Hezekiah is not saying, God, deliver us from this murderous attacking king so that I can keep my job. He's not saying, deliver me so that my reputation isn't ruined. He's not praying, deliver me from my attacking enemy so that I don't look like a failure or or so that my integrity isn't called into question. He's not even saying deliver us from this king so that my wife and kids might survive, although that is a legitimate prayer. He's saying, now Lord God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms on the earth may know that you alone are God. That is a God-focused prayer. It is a God-glorifying prayer so that all the nations may know that you alone are God. One of the most sobering verses when it comes to prayer is James 4 verse 3 that says, When you pray, you ask God, sorry, when you pray, when you ask God, you do not receive what you ask for because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your selfish pleasures. God's chief goal is not to make us healthy, wealthy, happy or thin. God's chief goal is to conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And Hezekiah, this young king, he understood this. He understood. So he prayed, deliver us from this attack, O God, so that every kingdom in the world will know that you alone are God. These kingdoms have their own gods. They have their own kings. But you are king of kings. You are lord of lords. You are the one true living God. Deliver us so that they will know that. He wanted God's name to be lifted up, God's glory to be made known. He wanted the kingdom of all the kingdoms to fall on their their knees and worship the one true living God. In fact, Scripture declares that that will happen one day, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. I wonder when we're confronted with the lunatic neighbouring warring kings, threatening us, threatening our churches, threatening our well-being. When we pray, Lord, deliver us. I wonder what your so that is. I wonder, is your so that, is it so that I might benefit? Is it so that my life might be easier? Or is it that God might be glorified? Is it so that I don't have to deal with this mess? Is it so that I won't look bad? Or that God would be worshipped? Think about the difficulty that, a difficulty that you're facing now or that's coming up or that you've maybe been praying um, towards. Think about the prayers that you've been most passionately praying lately. What is your so that? If you pray like Hezekiah, you begin with a faith and a confidence knowing that your prayers for God's glory. Well, let me finish off the story of Hezekiah. There he is in the temple. Spread out this letter, this threatening letter from the king. He's spread out before God. He's handed it over. He prays this beautiful prayer, God, deliver us so that all of the nations and kingdoms will know that you are God. And then God sends a prophet. And this is just a beautiful part of the story. God sends a prophet into the temple. And he taps Hezekiah on the shoulder. Hezekiah's like, huh? And the prophet says, God's got this. He goes, what? The prophet says, God heard your prayer 
Now he's got this. This is so beautiful because God knows our weakness. God knows that it is our predisposition to worry. It is our deep drive to try and fix things. Our struggle is, is in the letting go and the wait. And I reckon Hezekiah's heart was going, all right, God's got this, so I'll just I'll sound the trumpet and you know, I'll rally the troops and, and we'll go out and fight. And the prophet says, no, 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 no. God's got this. Here's the exact quote from uh, 2 Kings chapter 19, uh, verse 31, because you're probably wondering where it, like, it's not in your Bible. This is what the prophet says to Hezekiah. The zeal of the, of, of the Almighty God will accomplish this. The zeal of Almighty God will accomplish this. God's got this. The zeal of the Almighty God. This is one of those cases, Hezekiah, where you don't even have to lift a finger. Because God's got it. Your army won't accomplish this. Your best efforts won't accomplish this. All of your, you know, human wisdom and, and passion and learning, that's not going to deal with this. God's got it. The zeal of the Almighty God will accomplish this. Some of you know what happened next that night. The Lord sent one angel. Not hundreds, not thousands, not hundreds of thousands. One angel. You know, what is impossible for man is simple for God. He said, you just, you know, one angel. The rest of you can just stay here hanging out in heaven with me. Any volunteers, one sends one angel into the enemy camp, decimated the entire enemy army, 185,000 soldiers. That's how God dealt with it. Now, rumours would have spread around the world from there. 185,000 soldiers don't just disappear and no one wonders why. Every now and then I come home from work and Karen's not there and I think, did the rapture happen or something? <laughs> But 185,000 soldiers, dis not disappeared, but dead, decimated. People would have talked. They would have heard news of what it meant to come up against Hezekiah and Hezekiah's God. They would have all known there's only one true God in this world, and he is powerful. But we are not going to mess with Hezekiah because Hezekiah's God is alive. We're not going to mess with Israel because Israel's God is real. Israel's God hears their prayers, protects his people. Israel's God guards their borders. Those who worship Hezekiah's God are safe. They are provided for. They are loved. Hezekiah is friends with this God. I want to remind you this morning that there is a powerful God the one true living God, and through Jesus, you are his friend. No matter what you're facing, no matter what comes against you, what murderous king, what maniac neighbour, we all have a few maniac neighbours. <laughs> through Jesus, you're friends with the one true living God who only has to lift a finger and that thing that was humanly impossible is dealt with. There is one who would rather come to your assistance than do anything else. There is one who would rather meet your needs, who is our great God, than do anything else. Because of Jesus, if you've received bad news lately, if you're struggling with an impossible reality, if you, have, you need to know you have a friend who is closer than a brother. Theologically, we're talking about being in, in, imminent, but also all-powerful, all-knowing, overall ruler of this universe, the one who flung stars into space, transcendent, overall. He cares and he can. 
So we're going to pray together now. And uh, I'm going to lead us in prayer, and you, you can pray uh, along with me or on your own. I might even give you some instructions along the way. We might start by filling our faith tank and reminding ourselves of who God is. And then let's get that so that right. Because we manipulate our own minds. You know, Scripture says the, the heart of man is deceitful above all things. You know, we, we tell ourselves we have right motives, but we don't even know our own motives. Let's do our best to get our so that right. But let's listen for the voice of the Spirit to whisper in our ear, God's got this. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. You don't even have to worry about it. Just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing and leave those things up to him. So let's pray together now. Will you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we are so blessed to be your children. You are a great and loving Father to us. You love us so dearly that you've lifted us out of our human condition and drawn us into your spiritual family. We are your very children we have a relationship with you. We have access to the very throne room of God through Jesus Christ, our King. And so we worship you for who you are. You, you are great and mighty, but you do not stand from afar and look onto our human condition. You actually understand it through Jesus who lived with us and um, amongst us and experienced life on this earth. But you created all of that for us. So, of course, you understand our condition. You come close to us in your mighty power. And we don't understand that. We, we see pictures in Scripture of the, those who, who um, uh, you had to hide um, you know, their eyes from you because to see the Lord was too great. Yet you, you call us uh, into your very presence. And we, we give you thanks for Jesus who made the way, who, who dealt with the sin problem that caused us to not be able to be in connection with and we're humbled by the fact that this great God and King that you are, our Lord Almighty, overall, that, that you would care about the things that trouble us, the things that come against us, the injustices that stand against us, the, the battles that we face. And Lord, I believe there are some here today for whom there are impossible battles that, that are, are coming against them right now. Uh, I wonder as we continue in prayer, as our eyes are closed and heads are bowed, if, if you're feeling like God's been speaking to you in this, that you've got a battle that you're facing, that you've got things coming against you that you just don't know how to deal with, if you feel like you're in that place of Hezekiah where you need to lay that out before God, I wonder if you just in faith stand where you are and, and allow God to take note of you um, and ask to pray for you. If there is something standing against you, if you're experiencing that threat, not necessarily against life and limb, but against your ministry, against your family, against your life, and you want to lay that out as Hezekiah did before the Lord, you want to lay that out before him. Stand, and that's what you're doing. Maybe hold your hands out before you as if you're laying that out before the Lord and you're giving that over to him. You're in his temple. Uh, you're amongst his body right now. He is here in our midst. We're laying this, this threat, this trouble, this trial, this problem out before you, God. And we're saying, like Hezekiah did, please, please would you, would you rescue me from this? Would you redeem this situation? Would you deliver me for your glory? So that you might be glorified, so that you might be seen as the victor, so that you might be seen as the one true living God. We hand this over to you. If there's someone standing near you, you, you might want to tap them on the shoulder and say, God, God's got this. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And God, we ask that you will. We ask that you will for your glory. Because you love us. That's who you are. And so we... Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Would you remind us of that? In your perfect time, in your perfect way, would you deal with us as we need to be dealt with, but would you also remedy 
the, this, the, the conflict that we're facing by delivering us in your perfect way for your glory that we might be able to stand amongst those who declare that the Lord has delivered me from this situation, from the hand of my enemy. I think of Psalms over and over again where David and other authors declare that the Lord is the deliverer. He's delivered me from the hand of my enemy, from the foulest snare. You are that kind of God and we worship you for that. Continue your work in us and amongst us now we pray in Jesus' precious name. Well, I said...